Okay. So welcome everybody to the 2022-23 Learning and Teaching webinar series hosted by the School of Social Sciences and Humanities here at the University of Suffolk. My name is Dr. Phil Nicholson. I am a lecturer in primary education studies here at the university. Um, before going any further, I would like to extend my thanks to Aisha Howells um, for handing over the reins to the seminar series for the upcoming academic year. Um, Aisha did a fantastic job last year and I hope to, to sort of build on the success that the seminar series has already developed. It's a real pleasure for me to sort of, sort of take this on. So in terms of what the webinar series aims to achieve, it's a supportive and welcoming space to discuss and deliberate a sort of a wide range of topics related to learning and teaching in higher education. The series presents methodologies, strategies, techniques of, of what is being implemented in higher education context, but also tries to discuss yes. and think about some of the discourses which are shaping learning and teaching higher, in higher education. So in this sense, it's a series that invites presentations on the what, the how, the why, and the where of learning and teaching in higher education. And on that note, I would like to welcome Professor Alison James to the series. Alison is a professor of learning and teaching and now works as an independent academic. She was awarded the National Teaching Fellowship in 2014 and is Principal Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. In today's webinar, Alison will be sharing findings from her funded study, The Value of Play in Higher Education which is available as a free book with supporting documentation. Her presentation today is titled, Is Playful Learning Proper Education? Alison will speak for approximately 40 minutes with the remaining time of the webinar allocated to questions and discussion. Please post them throughout the, throughout the talk and we will come to them towards the end. So without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alan uh, Alison as the first speaker of the 2022-23 series. Alison, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Phil, and lovely. I was going to say lovely to see you all, but of course I can't see anybody, which is a real shame. But um, I'm, I'm delighted that you've joined us this afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to be kicking off the series. Obviously, um, playful learning is something that we associate with primary education and there's a massive literature around that. Um, my focus is on the post compulsory sector, particularly universities, but I would say at the outset that actually what I have to say really has to do with some of the challenges that we face throughout uh, our kind of formal education in the UK and not just in the UK, but in other countries as well. So the study that I'm going to present has quite a long tail, if you like. It stretches back into um, many years work that I did leading up to the present time. I've always had an interest in playful, creative and imaginative approaches to teaching and learning. Um, perhaps in, not in rebellion, because I think they coexist, but my own university education, my first degree was modern foreign languages and it was a very traditional delivery. It was lecture seminars, it was read write, it was exam based, it was text based, it was wordsmithy. And that was something I was comfortable but with, but I didn't realize that actually that was just great good fortune on my part at the time. Um, and I think over the last a series of decades that we come to understand so much more around neurodiversity, around multisensory learning, about different ways of uh, needing to process about multiple intelligences. And those are things that I've dipped into over the years, as you can see from the books um, and journal articles that I've just popped up on the screen. Over on the left, you've got my collaboration with Stephen Brookfield, which was looking at creativity and playfulness in uh, critical reflection over on the right. You've got the edited collection that Christina Rancy and I put together um, of international contributors, over 40 different experiences and examples of play in higher education. And then the kinds of things that you see on the screen are catering for different uh, learning preferences, 
Um, and also looking at play in different contexts, things like developing leaders um, or uh, using particular playful approaches. So there's a big background and I'm one of many people and probably some of you are also uh, involved in this area in some way. Over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, I've been one of a number increasingly um, making a forceful argument for the place of play in higher education. And that's not an uncritical argument. And that's not an everything everywhere argument, but it is that for some reason, we have some, some in our thinking and some resistances around playful education uh, at all layers, but particularly from uh, 16 plus that I, I think merit uh, far deeper scrutiny. So the study is called this, The Value of Play in Higher Education, and uh, the book that I've written is entirely free, um, and you can, uh, well, you can basically Google, actually, if you Google James Engaging Imagination Free Book, you should get the link. Uh, I think Phil's going to put the link in the chat at the end of my talk as well. And if you can write really, really fast or you can do screenshots, then you can get this off the screen too. But it's freely available and it's all there. And... It, I was going, it's, I, I call it now, now it's out, a labour of love. It was certainly a labour over three years. And I think it's been a voyage of discovery for me too. Um, so I think one of the things I'd like to say going on is, yes, it's called the value of play in HE, but actually the principles are relevant if you are doing work-based um, learning and development or training, if you are in organisational development, um, any form of formal personal or self-development, including coaching. You know, some of my study participants were actually working as consultants alongside uh, higher education institutions or uh, conversely um, outside industry. So it's a very, very broad church. I would like uh, to mention my funder. Phil has already mentioned that this study was funded. And I was supported by the Imagination Lab Foundation, which is based in Switzerland with an international board. It is very interested in the intersection between management and organisation theories and the arts, sciences, imagination and play. Um, but it too has um, a broad interest area and allowed me to express my broad interests were basically every academic discipline, as well as paying uh, particular interest to management uh, education as part of my commitment to my funder. It's a charitable organisation, and that's one of the reasons that the book is completely free. My time was given freely, and all outputs are freely and widely available to anybody who's interested. They're actually available to anybody who's not inter interested, but let's face it, nobody's going to read a book that's 346 pages long if they hate it from the outset. So there is my um, aim, which is to investigate the use and value of play in universities and equivalent institutions. And I say equivalent institutions because I had people from uh, mili the, the military uh, in various countries, uh, from, as I said, consultancy, from bodies that aren't necessarily universities, but are involved in tertiary education. I've also mentioned my multidisciplinary interest and the uh, particular strand that uh, looks at management play. I ended up with participants from over 20 countries and I gleaned primary data from three surveys that I ran, two were with staff facing and one small survey with students, 50% of whom were in Denmark, 50% in the UK. And I conducted 65 semi-structured interviews. Now, I hadn't intended to research in this way. My plan in early 2019 was to, and this was what I got my funding for, was to travel, was to conduct play-based workshops and glean that, that sort of raw data from people engaging in play experiences and uh, analysing their perceptions and those experiences. Needless to say, we all know what happened. Everybody went on Zoom from early 2020 and that's pretty much where we stayed until a few months ago. As I've mentioned my own career, but the, the work of a great many other people has uh, sort of garnished this wonderful uh, body of secondary data. So I looked at play literature in general, play literature in HE, which is an emerging field. I looked at endless play practices. I talked to people about their experiences and through the two years of the pandemic, 
I either spoke at or participated in a whole range of events and experiences as we all tried to work out what it meant to be uh, learning and teaching remotely and um, playing at a distance. Uh, overall to the study, I had over 70 different academic programs represented and ultimately uh, generated around 300 examples of play. Very difficult to um, actually come up with a figure because some of those are generic areas like, uh, well, not something that you, you have something vast like game based learning, or you have um, artificial, in, artificial intelligence or virtual reality or online educational um, escape rooms or whatever. So quite, quite hard to put um, uh, an exact number on, but, but we're talking big numbers, which already tells us something about how many people are playing. What I was also going to find out, there was loads of people are playing. Some people don't know they're playing and some people don't want to say they're playing because they are nervous of how it will be received and of a cultural backlash within the institution. And I'll come to that later. I looked at a great uh, many play theorists and numerous publications on play of all sorts and a particular one that I wanted to investigate because I, I was fascinated by his work was that of the psychologist and eminent play guru Brian Sutton Smith who wrote a book called The Ambiguity of Play in 1997. And in that book, he number one, uh, to me, is he sort of stuck in my mind as somebody who says we fall into silliness when we try and define play. But he also did from play theory over the centuries, seven rhetorics of play. Um, and I'm not actually going to talk about the rhetorics of play this afternoon. They're a massive topic in, in their own right. But certainly if that theoretical side is something that interests you, have a look at uh, the, the book, find the bit that, that you want to have a sort of rummage around in and see what you think. One of the things that I've been very careful to do throughout the book, because I see it as a dialogue and I know that's a bit of a trite statement when you know I've written it and it's got interactive questions and things but, but, but the reader is not instantly able to come back to me um, and talk about it but it doesn't actually matter they can talk to somebody else about it they can talk to themselves about it great conversations happen with ourselves we know this um, so big theoretical thing there and the rhetorics were interesting in terms of the kinds of value people put on play, but also the value systems at work that say this play is OK, this play is not OK, or play is OK, but just not in an institutional uh, university context. One of the other challenges I set myself was if I'm writing about play, then yes, of course, I can write a traditional academic study and have play as something that is sort of down, down the end of the um, telescope, if you like. But as I, the more I wrote up my findings, the more I felt I have to make this playful because I have to prove that I can practice what I preach. I can marry scholarship with playful practices. So in fact, you'll find if you've dipped into the book at all, or if you do dip into it, I, I, I play with academic convention. I, I talk in a conversational, jokey tone in places. I have banter with my reader. Um, I, I break some of the norms and conventions and rules about third person objectivity. Um, I put in asides. Uh, at the end of every block, there is um, uh, and there's a number of reflections where I invite the reader to think about what I just covered, but I don't put it on the table and say, this is my truth, come over to my truth, my team. I say, well, this is what I found. What do you think? Does it resonate with you? Maybe it doesn't. What, where does that lead you? So I, I want very much the book to be uh, something that people can use as a resource for discussion and exploration. It's not my Bible. Um, so at three o'clock in the morning, all, all, all of us have our best academic ideas, I think at three o'clock in the morning, when I've been wrestling with this, how am I going to present my findings? I woke up and I thought, I'm going to play I Spy. So I've structured the book around a game of I Spy and even more randomly, um, the little voice in my head at three o'clock in the morning said, and you're going to use only words starting with the letter G. 
So I have taken massive liberties, needless to say, with academic structures in doing this, but I really rather enjoyed it. Uh, it was like a puzzle all of its own. So our gratitude um, uh, greetings instead of the you know author notice or whatever is a G um, guidance obviously how to read the book uh, a huge liberty with the abstract uh, calling it gazillions of pages in one um, but then you know there's 346 pages how do you boil down 346 pages into an abstract it's the challenge that everybody's faced who's ever had to write a PhD thesis or the MA thesis or or any kind of you know big document and so on and so forth so there are many more uh, contents i.e generalities but this is just to illustrate where my thinking was um so one of the sections my first section uh or one of my first sections was around looking at the incredible complexities around definite traditions of play, how we talk about it, what we think is play, how we define play, how we categorize it, and then introducing participants. So in the rest of this talk, I literally just cherry pick aspects of this work to kind of give you a flavor of, of, of what I found, where my thinking lies, and the sort of challenges that we face as uh, as a sector so we're very used to seeing play as light-hearted light-hearted activity opposite of work that's what people normally say when they talk about play when i say people i'm talking not necessarily about people who have studied play for any kind of in-depth purpose or educational context or whatever but it's the easy thing we think of and it's not that it's wrong but it's definitely incomplete and the uh, subsequent definitions of play that I'm going to offer are just a few from the ones that I found uh, in the course of my exploration. So we've got Peter Gray, who has written Free to Learn and is very well known for the work that he's done looking at play for school age children. And he talks about play not being defined by any single characteristic. And yet, of course, we do try. We do try to boil play down to, um, you know, key features like, oh, it has to be voluntarily undertaken. It will be intrinsically motivating. It will be free and open ended. It'll be this, that and the other. And he talks about the motives or mental framework underlying the observed behaviour, often what we call playfulness as well. But play and playfulness are different. Miguel Sicard in Play Matters has this wonderfully universal view of play, play as being in the world, understanding what surrounds us and who we are, a mode of being human. That is a far cry from being uh, a leisure activity. And Henrik's also kind of amplifies it and talks about the freedom of human beings to express themselves openly and render creatively the conditions of their lives. We're talking big stuff here. We're not talking, um, you know, uh, lightweight, trivial, lesser activity. And this is something that I think people who are, don't understand play in higher education have forgotten or haven't looked at. Um, Pat Kane, in his wonderful sort of radical social manifesto, the play ethic, cites von Schiller as play about taking reality lightly. And we see this all around us, jokey signs, um, people trying to get a message across in memes and gifs and political satire and this, that and the other. One of the things that was raised, has been raised by people time and again with me in relation to this study, but other things is, but what about play being dark? You know, uh, critics might say, oh, these play evangelists, they just think it's all, you know, shiny, happy people. It's all fluffy and rainbows and unicorns and innocent and this and the other, and it isn't. Well, come on, if anybody's ever read a fairy tale or watched a Disney movie and actually deconstructed some of the things that are going on, you know, there is a lot of darkness there. A lot of my uh, participants in the study said, we know that play potentially can have a dark side, but we're not condoning it and we are not engaging in that kind of play in higher education. We are about helping people develop. So actually, the darker side of play gets very little uh, of a look in in this study, and that is deliberate. However, I couldn't resist uh, sharing with you this particular um, cartoon that, that crossed my radar recently. And I'm wondering if you can recognize the uh, 
children's literature that those two figures come from. So anyway, no prizes there for guessing Alice in Wonderland on the left, uh, a wonderful children's book all about hallucinogenic experiences and The Wizard of Oz on the right with Dorothy and the one line that basically sums up the whole of the, the story or the film. So gallery is one of the sections of the book and in it, I look at types of play and HE types and I, I, I come up with uh, a model or if you like a typology of 17 different categories of play, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, but I also then in this, and this is a whopping section in the book, so it's full of examples of vignettes of people's stories about how and where they're using play and to what end, divided into these four areas that you can see on the screen. Um, now, before I quickly get into that, just a word about play and, and play-based learning, because obviously I've shown that we can have incredibly different takes on what play and playful learning is. But I just thought I would put up these um, very potted suggestions, because of course the great conundrum if you're researching something is quite often we research something to understand what it really is. But until you say what you really think it is, you haven't really got a starting point or a set of parameters. But this is essentially what, uh, what I'm talking about, although this is very, very reductive, but it's here if anybody wants a steer. Play in games as a means of engaging students in curricular activities. So I'm not talking about um, university sports clubs or things like that, or using the playful mindset as a means of engaging students in learning. And the fact that these are different, as I've already mentioned, and not necessarily the same as uh, creative learning, although people do mention creative learning um, and play quite often in the same breath. So these are my 17 characters um, categories, if you like, and some of them, if you just kind of let your gaze wander around this model, will look pretty familiar. So games and gameplay, that's something that comes up a lot in management education, but not just management education. In ecological studies, uh, you think of uh, political strategy, the game Risk, years ago, um, simulations and role play, uh, performance, theatre drama, yes, in the arts and humanities, but also in medical education or in law. Um, quite often things like physical or active or embodied play might be associated with uh, PE or sports coaching, but actually it's likely to be uh, many other forms uh, of or many other disciplines as well, and I'll have a look at those. So as you go around, you can see lots of things that look pretty familiar. Escape games, what a growth area they are. Um, and perhaps then you look and what I found certainly was if we look at solo internal or cerebral play, this gets less discussion. I mean, people might say, oh, but this is naturally implicated in, in our playful learning. But, but when you look at the literature, quite often it is vaunting the benefits of group and team play. But actually, we all play by ourselves if we set a challenge, say, to only, you know, only 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 breathe after we've taken 10 steps or um, uh, get to the other side of the bridge before 9 a.m. or whatever it is. Then, of course, we've got things over here like deconstructing and disorienting play. And in uh, a, a sort of an academic climate where we're, we're very obsessed with learning outcomes and aims and objectives and taking students to a predetermined point and telling them how they're going to get there and what they're going to do to get there, et cetera, et cetera. Something like this can be pretty radical. Um, so I have fewer examples of that. Um, in the study, but they are there. Magic and Illusion, again, is there. Free play, that's an area that um, uh, universities are quite nervous about. So, uh, largely because of the value for money agenda. What do you mean I'm going to put my students in a room and say, you know, you, 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 you play without any kind of goal or any kind of this, that and the other? That sounds like an absolutely irresponsible waste of time and money. And yet, if you think about it in certain areas like art and design, which is a field I spent uh, many years of my university career working in, that is part of experimentation, idea generation, and so on and so forth. But they don't call it free play, they call it studio time. So there are questions I think to be asked around what it is that we are comfortable with, 
i.e. normally purposeful play, play that fits learning outcomes, play that is instrumental. And um, what are we afraid of? And what, um, what are our reasons for that fear? So here a quick, a quick whistle stop with some examples from the 300 examples that I've already mentioned. Game, place, game based learning and play, huge area. This is from an advertising and marketing course in Australia, teaching improvisation and pitch and uh, creating an advertising uh, plan or campaign, if you like, uh, with lots of techniques, but also by using this game, which is about generating extra features. But wait, there's more. This is from organizational behavior again in Australia. And this isn't an actual visual from that course, but it's, it's a wonderful illustration of how a very simple, playful technique illustrates how what we intend and are sure we're going to get doesn't work out the way we plan. So uh, in this course, students line up uh, with their fingers underneath, two fingers from each hand underneath a rolled up piece of paper and they are told that all they have to do together is lower the piece of paper to the floor. And of course, what happens is that you have them all stand together with their fingers under this paper and suddenly somebody lifts a hand up. So somebody else lifts a hand up to level the paper. Before you know it, the roll of paper is going up in the air rather than down to the ground. So many examples of creating and making play that I was hard pressed to give you just a few of them, but certainly cake making, uh, loads of things with collage. Um, uh, are you a jigsaw? Are you a quilt? Um, Play-doh modeling, model making, um, somebody using fragrance pots to teach the concept of added value and somebody else who's using aromatherapy to teach uh, the principles of, of lean. Um, the item you see on the, on the right hand side is just a toy from Poundland that's been re, repurposed by students for teaching strategic decision making. Uh, somebody else who's teaching ethics, um, getting students to express ethical theory through creative or playful means. Uh, origami to teach line and plane um, in architecture or mathematics. Lots of things around toys and props. Here you've got the Sesame Street doll Elmo, and Elmo here stands for enough, let's move on. And rather than just shutting down a conversation that is either rambling on or going nowhere, somebody picks up the doll. Uh, um, a director or, or a, um, uh, a lecturer teaching uh, business law talked about using his son's Duplo pizzeria set to teach students why business rescue is better than breakup. Stickle bricks, Lego, Jenga blocks, lots of things like that to teach supply chain management and magic, as I've already mentioned. Lego serious play or Lego in, in its many guises comes up time and again as a means of expressing compl complex ideas metaphorically. And so it's not just the 300 or so examples that illustrate evidence of interest in play. There's been an increasing interest in play over the last six to eight years. We've seen a rise in the number of international and multidisciplinary associations, networks. There are, there are university clubs, a number of uh, UK universities and other universities have playful groups journals for uh, playful learning, uh, such as the Journal of Play in Adulthood, which I'll show you in a second, um, so many different projects. So already there is a growth in critical mass. This is good. So the Journal of Play in Adulthood, which again is open access, you can find it freely available online. This is one of its most recent issues. Um, that's quite interesting because they would have liked to call it the Journal of Adult Play. There's been a big debate around reclaiming the term adult play because unfortunately we live in a society where adult play is, has very different connotations and people snigger and think, oh, it must mean something, um, you know, something really inappropriate for the university sector. But actually, if we can talk about children's play, adolescent play, why can't we talk about adult play? It means so much more than the kind of musical jokes that surround it. Uh, Exeter is one university run a playful university club and it has uh, a playful lab evenings as well which are open to everybody. Aston University for years has had its own game-based learning centre in the um, business school but again uh, using game principles that are widely transferable. 
uh, based in Denmark, but international as a playful university platform. And they have come up with fantastic work, including a wonderful publication uh, that you can find if you go onto their website, again, freely available and downloadable about playful voices in academia. Uh, the Playful Learning Association, again in the UK, but with an international uh, audience and participants, has been going for oh, probably 12 years or more now. And it started life as the ALT-SIG, the Alternative Learning Technology Special Interest Group. And that runs conferences yearly in Leicester when pandemics permit. And that again is a long established, fascinating organization of like-minded people who are exploring playful means of teaching and learning. In the States, this is a newer network, but it's notable for a number of reasons, not least that it's hosted two play posia. Um, I was honored to speak at both of them. Uh, Pat Kane was the uh, leading speaker at the one in 2021, and he didn't absolutely barnstorming talk about play, which again is freely available. They're just about to bring out a book with endless examples of play. And, you know, they now have 800 members within the space of just about two years. So they, they and some of the uh, illustrations that I've shown start to tell us why play is proper education, but let's start to boil it down. And again, I go into this in much more detail in the book. Play isn't the opposite of work. It isn't the opposite of study. It's not what we do when we put the pencil down. It enables the grasp of complex materials, concepts, theories, knowledge. Play is the difficult, serious learning. It's about novel means of working through issues and generating ideas. I think we all must have our faces down on the table if we think that we have to have everything as flip chart, pen, lecture, seminar. Let's all get into small groups. Play stretches the mind, it stimulates curiosity, brings activity alive, seeds possibility. Now, I am, I am massively summarising what my participants are telling me, but what I've also found to be the case from the literature and from my own experiences. Really important for difference, not just different ways of teaching, but different ways of seeing and being in the world and different experiences, including what it means to be with the in crowd, what it means to be with the out crowd, where discrimination exists. Great for building self-confidence, enhancing personal qualities, and very much play speaks to what we find valuable or what we think is valuable. And a number of educators have said to me, that play is about their own personal values. And when their personal values align with the values of their educational system and institution, then it works brilliantly. But if they are working in a neoliberal metrics driven organization that thinks play is for babies and that you can only possibly assess if you do it in a certain way or you teach in a certain way, then that really creates a lot of misery and exclusion. Play is about being ourselves, and that doesn't mean not respecting the traditions of academia or the standards of academia, but it's about being genuine. And it creates connection and relationship, and this has been incredibly important during the pandemic. Right at the beginning of 20, universities rightly were preoccupied with how on earth could they, with no warning, make sure students could still have a learning experience, and so they were frantically shoving um, materials online. Let's make sure that, that students can access information. But of course, it took no time at all for people to realize that information on its own wasn't going to cut it. If students felt isolated, unsupported, far away, terrorized, um, and so on and so forth by the circumstances we all found ourselves in, what they needed was connection. They needed to know that people were out there, that they had their backs. Connection and relationship fundamental before we get to content. A couple of quick examples here. Um, in some people, particularly those who are a bit snarky about play, um, uh, will say, oh yes, it's all very well, you know, it's all about creativity and feeling comfortable, but, but you know, that, that's, that's all. But actually there are so many other reasons in addition to the ones that I've just cited there. And these are from two of my study participants. 
One talks about the ways that play in in increases students' intrinsic motivation. So I, as faculty, didn't have to work as hard for them to learn. They took the learning upon themselves and worked hard to learn and teach each other. That is not us ducking our responsibilities. That is what we seek when we try to engender playful learning or peer learning. And we don't always manage it, but if play can do it, then so much the better. And this one from business, talking about a very specific aspect of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, ideation, it's critical to innovation and success. Playing with scenarios allows teams to see the benefits of good ideation, allowing them to then approach the real challenge with a much better mindset. Goes right back to what I was saying about play being about the subject matter and difficult concepts. So I've already mentioned that connection is super important. And here's another piece of evidence that supports that. The third edition of the Connected Student Report, which came out in 2021, which found that 76% of students inter interviewed across these countries and 73% of staff reported that maintaining their well-being remains a challenge. Not only that, but this is equally important research on a smaller scale brought out by Professor Lee Waller at HALT, and, and it was the basis of the PhD that she conducted, but she also released it as a research report. And it was about the impact of when we feel like we don't belong at work. Now, Waller wasn't necessarily uh, advocating play, but she was certainly saying that if, if we don't belong at work, then things happen to us in the way we interact with our colleagues and in the way we feel about the jobs we have to do, in our belief in what we're capable of. And we cave in on ourselves, we lose our confidence, we become demoralized. We feel, we start getting perhaps a sense that, that people don't want us there or need us there and we can't make a contribution. And consequently, how we operate uh, changes, we recede. And that's exactly what students do. If they don't feel that they are supported, connected, motivated, then, you know, if university isn't, isn't a place where they feel they, they have a place, then they are going to change those behaviours. And if play can help them, them get over some of those obstacles to that sense of not belonging, then that is so much the better. And one of the interviews said, and this is not the only way, but this is one of the ways, building connection through play. And play isn't the only way you can do this, but it's certainly cited time and again as a powerful means. Connect with the one thing in their life that they're passionate about, and then you release a whole group of other things. And this person, feeling particularly downhearted, said that they felt that the UK education system was a lot about meeting standards rather than releasing passion. Now, in a past life, I was a director of academic quality and development, and I remember having to try and unite both of those things. And I do feel that many educators absolutely are about releasing passion. They care deeply about their subject and their students, but they do work within very constrained circumstances. And it's how you marry the two. So, lots of reasons why it's great, but not everyone is convinced. And some people are quite unforgiving about play. They will cite an experience they had once when you know, they played with Lego or somebody forced them to do something embarrassing with plasticine. And as far as, as they're concerned, you know, that's the end of that. So people will be very ready to cite, not when I say people, um, I'm, I'm using it as a very lazy sort of catch-all, but I don't want to have to say educators, administrators, managers, researchers, blah, blah, blah. So, um, but the, but the kinds of criticisms that I'm going to show you are criticisms that actually we could, we could make about all sorts of teaching and learning approaches. And some of the tired and tried and quite frankly, boring approaches that we insist on perpetuating because we say that they are, you know, they are traditionally respected, even if people do them really badly. Um, views around the things that get in the way in the play, I put in this section called gargoyles, and, and I deliberately called it gargoyles because of the kind of mixed views around it. So if you look at a gargoyle uh, on the edge of a cathedral but buttress, depending on who you are, you'll either think, good lord, that's hideous, or you'll think, that's funny, that's amusing, um, that speaks to me. Um, and it's the same with the kind of conflicting opinions that circulate around play. So 
people don't play because they're afraid that they will look silly, which probably means they don't trust the person who's going to invite them to play. There, is, there are all sorts of blockages around whether or not it's appropriate or useful in a university. I think I've given you some pretty good arguments why that's not right. I did come across, I have come across time and again, people who will come to me when I've done a play workshop, when I've given a talk, when I've worked with whatever, when I've done my own teaching and they say, colleagues would have liked to take part, but they're afraid if they get involved in, in playful learning or attend things like this, they won't be seen as credible academics. Good grief, if we live in an academic climate that says that that's actually a thing, then I'm afraid that's, that's pretty, pretty sorry commentary on the state of some of our academic institutions and priorities. There's also this ridiculous perception that if you have playful learning, it's dumbing down. It's less rigorous than so-called serious learning. But we don't talk about serious creativity, serious innovation, serious entrepreneurship. So why do we have to talk about serious play? You can tackle deep issues rigorously, playfully. Some people don't like the play in question. Fair enough. Some people feel awkward. That's perhaps about things they're bringing to the party, but also perhaps about the facilitation. That's something we can do something about. Perhaps they've had, as with the, the bad, you know, the grumpy cat and the Lego experience, they've had a bad experience and that is uh, blocking them from wanting to engage in any future experiences. And just as we can teach badly, lecture badly, do PowerPoint badly, we can play badly. Of course we can, but that's, that's all, you know, that's not about the fault of play, that is about our abilities as educators. So we have to bear various things in mind. Play is subjective, we have our personal preferences, what I like, maybe stuff you don't like. There are also what I've called in the study many, many polarities of play, these kind of contradictory points. Case in point, you will find lots of people who say, oh, students love competitive play, we have lots of competitive play, we have leaderboards and prizes and we have this, that and the other and it always motiv motivates them, it brings out the best. Conversely, you have educators who say, I hate competitive play, I only want to do collaborative play, it brings out the worst in students, blah, blah, blah. Um, play is inclusive, play is divisive. Play, we have to remember, is culturally informed. I dedicate a whole section of the report to cultural difference in play. We don't all play the same way in different countries. Play is contextually situated. Um, you know, play in one context will be appropriate, in another would be deeply inappropriate. Some people argue that play is the answer to everything. Many more, and I do situate myself with them, is that play is not necessarily the panacea for everything. I think sometimes critics of play say, oh, if you're advocating playful learning, then you must be saying, throw the baby out with the bathwater, don't do lectures and seminars anymore, don't assess by essays, don't do this and the other, we'll just all mess around and have a jolly good time. And of course we're not saying that. You know, we have always argued that to be a good educator, you have to have the right tools at the right time. So how can we foster playful engagement in HE, positive playful engagement? Here are some ideas also from uh, the uh, what will enable play to thrive in HE section of my report. So here's an illustration from a play, play and creativity festival that I and some colleagues co-convened in the University of Winchester. We ran it for three years in a row. Uh, again, on my website, you can find out heaps of information around that. First of all, we have to allow people to recognise the importance of play, which takes me right back to the beginning of moving away from reductive definitions of play, deepening understanding of the complexity of play, trying to cultivate an openness of mind within the institution. There's a lot of negativity, there's a lot of myth-making, there are a lot of assumptions made about play that actually are rooted in fear, misperception and ignorance. Let's eradicate those. Yes, there may be times when play is a really bad idea. The kind of play that is being uh, suggested by somebody is inappropriate. It's been really badly thought through, but that is not necessarily a reason not to play at all. Let's provide welcoming spaces and events where people can explore all kinds of play, but not dictate that only one play is okay or one form of play is better. 
Let's coax people to explore play, but let's not force them. The moment we force them, you're going to send them in the opposite direction. And let's allow for a bit of free play. Let's allow for experimentation and a little bit of purposelessness. We can't always be dancing to an agenda, dancing to a pre-designed tune. And I know that we've all been up against it for decades around ever reducing time, resource, energy, constantly being faced with the monster of bureaucracy, being expected to do more with less. I've lived through all of that. But let's actually find those open spaces in the institution and give ourselves permission to use them. Here's one of the models from um, uh, the book that, that kind of uh, points to some of the polarities of play, which uh, sum up the very diverse positions around it. But these are really important for people to understand before anybody gets too high horsey about what is and isn't appropriate. The other thing is we are in a driven culture. We've got to have an outcome, we've got to pr have productivity, we've got to be able to measure value, prove value as the only worthwhile basis for activity. Well, let me tell you, I've worked in staff and educational development for more than 30 years, and there are wonderful things that both generate that you can't measure by an evaluation form or by uh, by sending out um, an email asking somebody what they've, what they've got out of the process and how their own performance levels have improved since they did that course. You can't always prove that connection and correlation also let's give playful educators some respect some credibility and actually if players are rebellion and a number of them describe themselves as non-conformists let's not tar them with the troublemaker brush if they are choosing to work in that way let's not insult them by describing them as lightweight academics if they're choosing to express themselves in that way and let's get away from a tokenistic agenda around well-being. Now, I, I say that in the full knowledge that many, many, many institutions are bending over backwards to really get, uh, get on top of issues of mental ill health and ill-being within the university. But we also know that sometimes in some places there is a cynical agenda there. We're going to give you all free yoga classes, but we still expect you to work to the level of demand and productivity and um, antisocial hours that actually the workload generates. And let's understand and allow people to have different kinds of play. Now, I've already illustrated this with lots of emerging networks. Why don't you set up your own? Now, this is my last slide. So this is really just so that we've got some space now for questions. And I'm sorry, I have taken a few minutes out of the 20 left for discussion, but I'm, I'm happy to stay on for five if that's allowable. Uh, this is where you can find um, the report if, uh, I hate calling it report, my study, um, if you would like to know more. This is my website if you would like to know more. You can find me on Twitter, although I keep threatening to leave Twitter because I, I do find it a very split experience. And there is my email if you want to talk to me about play. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now and um, I think Phil's going to curate some questions and discussion points and thank you for listening. Alison thank you ever so much that was fascinating. We have some questions coming through um, so let's straight yeah. to them. So we have Alison Clark who has joined us this afternoon it's nice to have you with us Alison and Alison's yeah. question for you is how do you think students' own experiences of learning before university impact on whether they are willing to accept open-ended, play-focused styles of learning? Oh, massively, Alison, massively. And I think that's one of the, the tragedies. And I talk to a lot of secondary educators about this, you know, Play has been squeezed out of secondary school. Play is getting squeezed out of primary school where it absolutely should be thriving. But um, secondary education, time and again, um, unfortunately, the, the focus is taken away from uh, creativity, uh, playfulness, and, and the same sort of metric driven, horrible matrices about what students can demonstrate at the end of a course module, piece of homework, whatever. 
they are getting in the way. So uh, students are losing the faith. So when they come to university, no wonder some of them are terrified if they see somebody saying, you know, instead of sitting you down behind a nice safe de desk and asking you to do these nice recognizable activities, um, let's do something else entirely. It would scare the living daylights out of some of them, I would imagine. But that is where our job as university educators is to recognize that and work with it, um, you know, and, and I think we all do that. When I worked in arts and science institutions, they talked a lot about enabling their students to unlearn how, how maybe they learn to draw, design, do whatever. And I think we do in first year, that's part of what we have to do is, is support students to unlearn and build that confidence to learn in different ways. I hope that was an answer. Thank you, Alison. Um, and we'll go to Ivana's question next. So uh, Ivana says, thank you for the lecture, Alison. From her experience, children and experienced adult players will just dive into and offer activities, but hesitant adult players tend to join in when they understand the purpose. Yeah. Uh, and when she explicitly expresses my intentions with the playful activity, yeah. what are your thoughts or experiences? I, I, I'd agree. I'd agree. And I think that's, that's about... That's about us having, and this is, but this is something we should be doing already as teachers, never mind playful educators, is we should know that we have people of different characters, diverse capabilities, different backgrounds in the room. So whether it's play, whether it's something else, we're already navigating what people feel comfortable with and what people feel totally overfaced by. And so sometimes it's as simple as having a little activity to test the water. You know, and say to people, how do you feel like that? If you are working with your students and you're building up a relationship and you're seeing them every day or every week, then that's wonderful. That's a journey that you can go on. But quite often, and certainly in my career, I was constantly getting parachuted into situations where I was meeting students for the first time. And so my job was to engage their trust in me so that we could play together without me overfacing them. And I think the way to do that Sometimes it is absolutely to say, okay, we're going to do something now, trust me, and maybe there's an explanation. Or alternatively, it's, I want you to believe in me. We're going to do something. You might think it's a bit weird. You might not know where this is going, but we're going to debrief it afterwards. Um, so, you know, people, people are very different. People will jump in or, or, or people will, you know, you can see them clutching their coat, hoping they can run for the door. Um, it's, it's human nature, but that's part of our skill as a teacher and a facilitator of recognising that and working with it so that people can get as much out of it as possible at whatever level or to what extent they can. Thank you very much. And we will go to Rob's question next. So Rob um, says, thank you, Alison. Um, but what do you think are the areas of education which are the antithesis to play? Oh, Rob, I think that's a PhD question, really. What a great question. Um, I think it depends how you unpack areas of education. So if, if we are you know, do we mean assessment? Do we mean course design? I think sometimes it's not necessarily the area of education, it's the interpretation which the people in charge of that area of education are putting on it. You know, somebody who invited me to speak at a well-known university a few years ago and was genuinely interested in play, but was saying, well, the thing is I can't reconcile the two because my job is to educate, not entertain. And I say, well, why can't you do both? So I think it's sometimes the area of education might be hamstrung by the perceptions, you know, about what is right and what is proper. Um, uh, sorry, Rob, that's, that's, that's not a terribly helpful answer to your question, but if you want to, um, if you need to refocus it or something to get a more helpful response from me, pop it in the chat. Thank you, Alison. I think something with me particularly resonated was a quote that you said, we can't always dance around an agenda, which I, can, I think kind of summarises that, that idea as well. Um, we've got a few more questions that have come through. So Joe would like to know, what is the research evidence or areas of study that you think are most needed um, to develop a greater value uh, of play? Now, that's, that's another really interesting question. Number one, I would say, I would say, Research, the, uh, research is building. I think because of how play is 
misunderstood and viewed there a lot of people want to see research that proves that proves play is effective um, i always resist that a little bit although you know i'm always delighted when people come up and say you know i i, I evaluated it this way or we got the evidence that did that so i think there's a big thing around proof but i i would be really miserable if if research into proving that play is effective was the only form of research. I think, I think the field is wide open, actually, because it will depend on how, you know, how you feel about your discipline, what you think your discipline needs or your students needs or where you think the gaps are and, and what play might do for that, because play might do different things for different people. What people did, did talk about time and again, uh, which I thought was very powerful, was play as, as, an, as a means of creating a different society or a different world. You know, they went absolutely to the massive stuff. It wasn't just, you know, play to show you how to make good decisions or, or play to make you come up with ideas. It was, let's actually reinvent human existence. And, you know, <laughs> wow. Um, so again, bit of a kind of rambly answer there but i think it, it it does it does depend on what you what you think is missing and what you most need and are most interested in i mean, i welcome all of it everybody do all of it thank you so much and there's just more comments ready now than questions alison so just okay. thank you for your comments about how interesting this was um in terms of developing a rapport with people in social care um and Fran as well, almost thinking about um, how we can start to include play in um, recruitment and selection procedures, but without making it a tick box exercise. Could, could, I, could I actually give you a little, a little anecdote from the, the, the book on that one? Because one of my participants talked about, and I've actually used play in, in job interviews and in community meetings and in high level situations. And this particular person had incorporated a play activity in a presentation that she was doing for a job interview. And uh, somebody on the panel uh, said, in a slightly disparaging fashion afterwards, um, well, I can see how that makes you really popular, but you know, where's the meat of your subject? which is a really acid kind of observation to make. So I think if we, if we do incre in include it, and there is a lot actually, a lot going on in the areas of work-based play. Um, and I mentioned a few of the studies, but there's a huge, huge amount going on there. Um, but yes, I think it, it's important that we, that we allow people to include play actually in all our activities, without kind of judging it in the same way as we don't say, oh, you've worn a purple suit to this interview, so we won't let you in. You know, I know that's, that's a bit of a fatuous analogy, but, you know, some, some, of, our, some, of, our, uh, some of our responses sometimes can be knee-jerk. Now, I don't want, having said that, it sounds like I'm saying the whole world is against play. The whole world is not against play. The very fact that these participants are doing such fantastic things with play, that universities are receptive to play, that departments are supportive, that, that the field is growing, that it's gaining legitimacy shows that there's a lot of, of, of positive support for playful learning. Uh, but I think it's just, I feel that playful learning just faces a few more battles and oppositions than maybe other forms of learning do. Fantastic. And thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who was in attendance this afternoon. But most importantly, thank you to Alison for your time and fantastic insights. This has been such a great way to start the 22-23 webinar series. Um, please do make sure that you uh, check out Alison's book um, where she develops these ideas in more detail. Have I got time to put the link in the chat or have you done that, Rob? Uh, Phil, sorry. I was looking at the chat and saw Rob. Earlier on, but please do feel do it again. Um, the recording will also be in YouTube on the coming days. Now, before signing off, I would just like to signpost to the next presentation in the series, um, which is on November the 9th at 4 till 5, and it will be delivered by Professor Paul Ashwin from Lancaster University, and it focuses on reflective teaching and the educational purposes of higher education. I will post the link in the chat now so that you can sign up so that it goes into your calendars. Alison, thank you so much. Well, a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and enjoy your series. Thank you.